Hey, good morning, everybody. Almost afternoon, and we're, you're the last speakers before lunchtime, so we'll try to make our points quickly and concretely so we all, all can eat. This is the portion of the program where we start to move from the very large and broad topics to specific projects and services. And I know my own talk really focuses on services that libraries can develop in partnership with faculty to do the things we heard about earlier. In particular, my talk's going to focus really on green OA, and it's all about deposit, how to get things into repositories through re offering repositories and publishing services. And again, I'm going to talk specifically <clears throat> from my university and our experience, uh, Georgia Tech. I'm not going to talk a lot about the statewide repository service, uh, the Galileo Knowledge Repository, which has recently been IMLS funded, but I'll try to interject a few comments about that, and always happy to take questions on that project. So specifically, I think most of the speakers here today, we felt a certain anxiety, I think, and, and desire and need to, to convince everybody that OA is real, that this is happening. And this seems to be just the nature, the early nature of, of, the, of open access and what's going on. So I did a couple of real quick screen captures here just to share some basic data and to wonder what's going on with repositories. Well, we have, if you look at the Directory of Open Access Repositories, which as I did a few weeks ago, we have over 1,600 uh, open repositories worldwide. Many of them are in the US and the UK, but to me the, the outstanding thing is that they are everywhere. There are 84 other countries other than these top eight here that I've listed on the bottom that have uh, where repositories are present. So this is clearly a global trend. Related to this, when we look at a few other figures about what's happening with journal production going electronic and open access as well, you can quote certain figures like Ulrich's periodical directory, and I think this is a very specific and narrow, narrow directory. It lists about 27,000 uh, scholarly journals, or there are probably perhaps more than that. But I like their figure that they list what's online, active, and referee journal titles. And it's roughly 71% of what they list in their own directory. So again, clearly we're moving electronically, as we know. When you look at the directory of open access journals, uh, we're about 5,000 titles at this point. And the interesting thing, when you look at the last couple of years, we're adding about 800 to 900 journal, OA journal titles a year globally. So clearly this trend is very much on the uptake. And there's a lot of different ways and business models uh, that this uh, moves forward in. And I'm going to talk about uh, some of the journals that we support at, at Georgia Tech and how, that's, how that happens as well. And again, we hear a lot about uh, you know, STEM field, science, technology, medicine. But I like the report that Mark Ware Consulting has done where we see, you know, 96% STM journals are electronic. But when they, when they did their study and they looked at arts, humanities, and social sciences, they came up with this number of 87% of those journals have some kind of electronic equivalent to it. So again, that's just my quick way of trying to convince everybody that, you know, we're electronic and, and open is a very significant trend. Moving on from that, what are our institutional goals at Georgia Tech in terms of what we're doing around open access and repository and publishing services, as well as the outreach and awareness building programs that we've engaged in? I mean, number one, from a library perspective, we think about pro uh, providing stewardship for digital scholarship and research materials. We want to, to be that, that institution, that organization that stewards the materials. Uh, we identify, assess, and collect, and, and the like we t in terms of born digital material. And we also spend a lot of time converting to digital uh, formats. We've actually converted all 11,000 of our print theses and dissertations, which are now in our open repository, which we call Smart Tech, which is, uh, stands for Scholarly Materials and Research at Georgia Tech. So we feel, of course, these things really support the research and educational endeavors of the university to have access to Georgia Tech's materials. And we do spend a lot of time uh, trying to raise awareness amongst faculty as to what's, what's going on. We've had many faculty, we heard uh, earlier from Michael about you know, not signing over copyrights to publishers. We've had many faculty approach uh, our group around digital services and rights, uh, wanting to know more about, about this. And I think one of the reasons why is, is these agreements get more and more restricted. We've had many faculty, probably at least on a monthly basis, come to us. And, and hold up some agreement that says, you know, I can't use any portion of this article in any sort of course material I want to develop for my own course. What am I supposed to do with this? So it's statements like that that really begin to you know, irritate faculty in terms of limiting what they can do even within their own educational uh, endeavors. So our own background, I mentioned Smart Tech, Scholarly Materials and Research at Georgia Tech. We opened this, it's a DSpace platform repository that we opened in August of 2004. So we've been running for almost six years. Now, uh, it's quite large. We have about 30,000 objects in it, so we're probably, in terms of the size, we're probably about top five or six uh, IRs within the US at this point. 
Again, probably 40% or so is our electronic theses and dissertations. We've had an electronic uh, deposit, electronic only uh, approach to theses and dissertations at Georgia Tech since uh, 2004. It was kind of partial in 2003, so we began. And then a few years later, we spun off this thing what we call ePage at Tech, uh, electronic publishing at Georgia Tech. And this is where we publish. We uh, do support a couple of OA journals on the campus with our faculty. We also do things like uh, produce uh, conference proceedings from our campus and the like, and, and as well as a developed an outreach program. And so these are the items that I will talk about more. Again, quick screenshot, Smart Tech. I think you all probably have seen repositories and what they, what they look like. Again, this is the DSpace platform. Specifically, I always get questions about technology and how we do this and who all works on this. So I thought I'd just give you the basic rundown. We're working on, uh, we're running on DSpace 1.6 right now, and we use Mannequin for our, uh, for our user interface. We engage in a little bit of uh, code adjustments, but not a lot. People tend to think that, you know, if you're going to use open source software that you have to have, you know, lots of programmers and do lots of different things with the software. Not necessarily. We pretty much run it out of the box with a few, a few light changes. <clears throat> we have several staff that work on this. Uh, we have one particular person. This is all part-time effort. These are not three full-time systems analysts, but we have somebody who really has a nice background and skill around batch loading, and he's helping others in the state with our Galileo Knowledge Repository service to get uh, existing content into the new repositories that we're bringing up uh, within the state with that project, which includes the uh, Medical College of Georgia, which is a place that does not have a repository yet, but will within the year. So we do have somebody specifically who deals with interface design and usability and usage of the, of the site, as well as many other uh, sites that we have that the library supports. And of course, we have a systems analyst that deals with upgrades, systems administration, and the, the code base itself. In terms of content management, we do have a professional librarian who runs it, who's also kind of the ETD coordinator, so electronic theses and dissertations. We have two metadata specialists. This is where I'm going to get into this a little bit more. We don't have a lot of faculty who actually deposit on their own on our campus. And I think, as Stephen had mentioned, there's a lot of them, a lot of repositories that don't have a lot of content in there right now. So early on, we just decided to put a couple of staff on this, and I'll explain more. Uh, what we do there, but we spend a lot of time collecting material from faculty on campus and doing the input ourselves through the DSpace submission interface. Uh, what else can I tell you? Cat these, the, the interesting thing, the metadata specialists are catalogers. Uh, we all kind of wonder what are we going to be doing in libraries, how are we going to switch from, from you know, kind of traditional functions to, to more digital roles and processes within our campuses, and in our case, I think the catalogers have made very very good people, I think, to kind of convert and deal with submission in our repositories and to go out and collect, and they have a pretty good sense of the subject matter and disciplines on the campus. Uh, so I think that's worked out very, very well for us. Some of the basic statistics, we'd like to think we're, we're a pretty successful site. I think one of the reasons why we're successful is we do spend an awful lot of time collecting this content. Uh, we're, in terms of I, what I call an item record view is basically that catalog record that's within Smart Tech, within the DSpace software. And you see this has been growing over the years. We actually have over two million views of item records within Smart Tech in the last complete fiscal year that we've, that we've seen uh, with over half a million searches. So I think, uh, again, this is, this is, we just basically started in 04 with putting up a default version of DSpace and go, get some basic content in there and start going. Luckily, we, uh, we, be, we had the uh, pleasure, really, of beginning with my former employer, the Institute of Paper Science and Technology in Atlanta, that is now a, a research institute that's part of Georgia Tech, but we had 3,000 items from previous work there of research reports of theses and dissertations, uh, technical papers that came from that research institute, so that made a very nice uh, grouping of material to put into the repository. There's still, almost every year when we look at what are the top 10 items that are being used in Smart Tech, invariably every year there's some kind of, there's at least one document from the Paper Institute, so very heavy users of, of a kind of a global research community around paper, paper making and paper processing. And we have nearly 15,000 theses and dissertations, and I think the trend we're seeing with IRs today is there, this is what we use them a lot for, probably 30 to 40, 50 percent of the material is theses and dissertations. In other words, this is the material that we are producing from our own campuses, particularly, obviously, our, our students in this regard. When we've looked at some of the high usage, or what is high usage, or when is high usage, it's kind of interesting. Monday mornings, 
uh, has been used a lot. We've crashed occasionally on a Monday morning because there's just so much use. I, mean, I think, you know, that's kind of the joke is, you know, people are hot off the weekend and want to do research and find materials. I don't know what it is. But by the way, I can tell you that about 90% of our hits in Smart Tech, uh, the page that they're in directly before Smart Tech is Google or Google Scholar. So again, the power of open content and use, making use of open search engines. And we have a very international group of people who use this site. Uh, again, the subject matter for a place like Georgia Tech ranges greatly, actually. We're not, we're, while we have a huge college of engineering, we run the gamut in the sciences, uh, architecture, management, uh, liberal arts, and social sciences as well. And we do have some top-ranked programs uh, in terms of mechanical engineering, aerospace engineering. The college of engineering itself is ranked fourth in the nation. So we seem to get an awful lot of use in some of those fields. Again, this is just another kind of uh, graphic to kind of show you the trend, how the, how the numbers have grown, how usage uh, trends over time, and how many materials that we have within Smart Tech itself. Now over 30,000 items. And then of course, exactly what, so we have 30,000 items. Exactly what is this? So I compiled this recently. I have a couple of different lists here, but this kind of gives you an idea. I kind of bolded the items that tend to stick out in terms of large groupings of material. We have a lot of conference proceedings, dissertations is a huge group. We throw a little bit of everything in there with the idea that maybe we can just help attract usage. A lot of the university's PR materials, newsletters and the like also go into, into the IR. But if we, we narrow it down, we look at the real research output from the campus, particularly from faculty. Uh, it does get smaller, but when you look at conference proceedings, technical papers, technical reports, you're still running about, you know, 10% of the IR is those kinds of materials. Again, with about, probably about a third of it being theses and dissertations. So, is what Stephen had said, is we, do, you know, we're all struggling with getting that real research output from our campuses in, in these repositories. And I think we've begun making that effort, and a lot of it is through uh, collecting ourselves and, and working through that phase with our, our researchers. So what do we do exactly? Submission workflows. We, we have, this is what we kind of call our library submission service, that we will do it for you. We have done a lot of batch loading of converted materials like the ETDs, uh, other digital collections. Uh, we help with manual submission. The, the other step we call self-submission with mediated deposit. There are people on campus who are submitting on their, on their own, but we're kind of holding their hand at this point. We're double checking their work and the like at their request. This is what they've wanted us to do. So. Basically, we'll do any, we have to have an attitude, I think, of do anything the researcher wants us to do. As a library, we provide services. And then there is self-submission without any mediated deposit. And there's just a few of those people, and this is our star, Professor Mark Ferguson in management. He is our one real depositor on his own. But uh, as you can see, I kind of grabbed a page here for his, his own web page, his bio, and the links below are to his articles. And he doesn't put them on his website. He has, these files are not on his website. They're simply links to RIR. And it seems like such a simple concept, but it's not an easy manner to get the faculty to understand that. Everybody wants to grab their PDFs or their recent articles and put them up on their, on their website. Um, but we've had uh, a few who've been able, you know, who see the value in doing this now. And they understand, too, that we have our own uh, preservation strategy and plans in place for the digital content as well. Uh, a lot of faculty will come to us when they find out about the IR and one of the reasons why is because their favorite graduate student just graduated and is not keeping their website up anymore. <laughs> and they're trying to figure out what to do, what to do with their latest scholarly article and they, they discover us. So we're happy about that but we love Mark, he's a great guy. There's other adopters. This is just another example of you know, a typical faculty member's bio with links to their articles that then link you know, directly to the repository themselves. In terms of copyright, what do we do as a library in terms of service for copyright? <clears throat> we, we basically, we again, kind of this attitude of we'll do anything. We get all sorts of calls and requests in um, from faculty looking at issues. A lot of it is about retaining their rights or the example I gave earlier about restrictions to teaching materials and the like. Um, but basically when we, when people deposit or we deposit for them in our IR, the terms and conditions are very simple, that the faculty member, the researcher owns their materials and they can do whatever they wish to with them. We simply ask for a non-exclusive arrangement so we can preserve and provide access to the materials that are in Smart Tech. Again, non-exclusive, that they can basically do anything that they want to do. We just want that right to preserve and provide access. 
Uh, sometimes we get things that are copywritten and for, by a third party and like a copywritten management process that people have spoken on and you know, we basically don't take those materials. We've had that happen quite a bit, actually, and we don't take those materials in because the people who are depositing them don't really have the, the rights to, to allow us to provide that access. So we've, we basically don't take those kinds of materials. It happens once in a while. On the digital conversion side, I think for libraries looking to get into these kinds of services, I mean, this is not a small matter uh, to, to overlook. I think we've done an awful lot of work around converting theses and dissertations, uh, final research reports that have been processed through our Office of Sponsored Programs. At a place like Georgia Tech, we have a lot of research universities have some sort of research park or research institute. And we have the Georgia Tech Research Institute, and we're doing over $500 million in sponsored research a year. So this has been a great source for us of final project reports uh, that we are moving into uh, the repository. And of course, we've worked with other things such as uh, the catalogs, of course, yearbooks and the like, the newspaper, the technique. So again, part of that is that's not the core research output, but we're hoping that by putting that material in, one, we're providing a worthwhile service, and two, that it's popular content and maybe will, people will come to Smart Tech and then think of it for other purposes as well, such as the true research output of the campus. Uh, I mentioned president's papers here. We had a president who recently left, who's now the general secretary of the Smithsonian Institution, Wayne Clough, but upon his departure, we got the transcripts of all of his speeches during his 13 years as president. So all of those transcripts are now available through Smart Tech. And we have some selected audio video that we're beginning to uh, convert and, and put in there as well. So we actually have a collecting policy about what, are, you know, since we go out and collect material, we're really trying to think in terms of what is the important stuff? What's the significant material that we're trying to bring in? And we have actually written a collecting policy for, for our institutional repository. And we do really take that from the strategic plan of the university itself. What are the strategic areas of research that Georgia Tech is trying to push forth on? And concentrate on that. So we try to make kind of that bigger bang for the buck in that sense. And of course our approach is that the sense of enduring value, that if you give it to the library, the library is going to continue its traditional custodial role of doing the best it can to provide uh, access to these materials uh, long into the future. Okay, next we'll move briefly into some of the publishing services that we provide that we call ePage at Tech. And that's, this site really includes links to Smart Tech, the IR, and some of the other things we do. ePage really refers to these things. We support a couple of journals. We provide a pretty robust and active conference proceeding production service. Especially in the sciences and engineering, we get an awful lot of sponsored conferences on campus. And we've worked a lot with those conference support providers on campus, our conference center and faculty who do that and give them that option if they want to produce a proceeding that we will do that and we deposit that material in our IR. Uh, if they, we've had occasions where somebody, a group of faculty running a conference will want to uh, sell, sell it on CD or keep it restricted. In that case, we, we decline to offer our services to those, those kinds of groups. We'll, if they, we do it for free if they will uh, deposit the material in, in our IR. We also record, do a lecture recording service. It's a bit of a misnomer. We don't record just any kind of lecture. We do a lot of distinguished lecture series, named symposia, and the like on campus. Again, this is a very classic scholarly activity, and that's where we kind of began. Once we brought up the repository, what are, the, what are these very typical and traditional scholarly activities that we can support? Well, the, you know, there's three of them. There's journals, there's conferences, and there's there's speakings, there's symposia and lecture series, distinguished lecture series in particular. So we've developed services with open source software really around all of these particular aspects. With the journals and conferences, we use the open journal system software and open conference system software for these. We basically set it up. We, we provide a lot of technical workflow uh, assistance with this. So again, this is a really good area for I think some of the more technical librarians and archivists amongst us and, and some of the systems people in terms of what are, they, what are they doing, what kind of new things will they move to, I think supporting these kinds of workflows and the actual production of scholarly output is a very important area, I think, and it's certainly something we can, we can move toward. A couple of journals that we support, really the flagship is this one pictured here, Information Technologies and International Development. Uh, the Tower is an undergraduate research journal that we kind of partnered up with our Office of Undergraduate Research with the student board now. It's been in existence for 
a couple of years. This is, it's open access in that regard. So this is a great way to get students involved with the publishing process, especially web publishing, and understanding you know, the value and power of, of open content. And the latest journal that we supported has one issue out is the International Journal of Facility Management, which comes out of our College of Architecture. Now, ITID, I got to tell you, makes a very interesting story. The editor, co-editor, is on our campus, uh, Professor Michael Best, who has a joint appointment in the College of Computing and the School of International Affairs. And it began as a print subscription-based journal under MIT Press. And he wanted to take it electronically and was fishing for support. And we were beginning to experiment ourselves with open journal system software. And he found out that the library was, was playing and tinkering with this. So he came and spoke with us about, you know, could we help him with his workflow? So of course we jumped all over this opportunity. We've been working together for about four years now and it's really been uh, a great collaboration. But since then he has moved this to, it's, you can get it in print if you, if you want to pay for the copy, but it's, uh, it's open access as opposed to subscription and it's largely electronic at this point. And it's now uh, no longer under MIT Press, and, and you know, Mike would tell you that the MIT Press journals really never really provided any kind of support for them in terms of electronic workflows. That's what we did. But they now partner with the uh, University of Southern California, Annenberg Press. That's what that A is there, the red A is Annenberg Press. So here again, this is still a, in a way a traditional, traditional arrangement where it's affiliated with a traditional press being Annenberg. Uh, it's put together by editors at USC and Georgia Tech, and the technical production work is supported by the Georgia Tech Library. In terms of business model for this, I should mention too that you know th this this particular project is almost like a perfect storm because it's really about use of the internet in the third world. So where do they get some of their funding? It's completely free, but for years now they've had they've had very modest, but a small amount of funding uh, from Microsoft, and that's really sustain their copy editing work and uh, again a lot of the technology work is what we subsidize but the, a lot of the copy editing support has been has been paid for by Microsoft but if you're Microsoft this is where your future is is use of the internet and and digital content in the third world so they actually they really love this journal conference proceedings uh, there's a lot of different fields that we produce these for again this has kind of turned into a very nice service for us we did this really uh, we kind of got the idea when we did our own. We did this for a couple of uh, conferences that we put on ourselves, electronic resources and libraries in particular. But these are some of the lists of subject areas that we've done these, done these for. We've also done some for uh, some of the liberal arts. We had a conference on the history of women's health in medicine that we also have a proceeding out for. Uh, again, this has been this is based on the open conference system software, and we've done this about 10 to 12 times. So we're really beginning to ramp up. We've done this for just a couple of years now, uh, but again, I think it really makes a nice complement to the journal work, and you end up with an awful lot of conferences that come through uh, major research universities. So that's something to give some thought to. The recording service, again, here, uh, basically what we do, again, they, they, all the speakers sign an agreement that you know, they own the material that they've produced, but that they allow us to preserve and provide access to the materials through the IR. We typically process this material and get it out within about 14 days. So again, another very popular service. Once we put this out there, uh, usually the offices and academic units uh, advertise this quite quickly in terms of what's uh, available from their latest symposium or lecture, and we get an awful lot of hits from this. So it's really kind of this of kind of of the moment need for the material. Uh, the distance learning programs like this a lot as well because it helps the distance learning students to feel like they're really part of the main campus because they're watching various uh, distinguished speakers um, on campus at that time. So again, just some technical details. I'm buzz through I think we gotta move along a little bit. Uh, outreach and marketing, some of the things that we've done, you know, within the library and on campus, we've developed an advocacy program to really talk about you know, building awareness of what's happening within the realm of scholarly communication. We've done programs in the summer for librarians. We've done talks for uh, faculty on the, on the issues, largely around author rights. And most recently, we've gotten involved in the International Open Access Week um, issues and have put on uh, panels during the year uh, around Open Access Week. Uh, this happens in October. We have been pretty active around the NIH policy. When this first came out, we partnered up with the Vice President for Research on campus and put together a 
a memo and a statement in terms of Georgia Tech supporting the NIH policy. And then we've gone through and done a few brown bags on training for people on how do you, you know, how do you submit to uh, PubMed Central and what do you need to know about this policy. And they've actually been very well attended. We've only done a couple of these to date, uh, but again, uh, they, we've had, you know, 20, 25 people at a time, uh, faculty members coming wanting to know more about this. So I think uh, this kind of bears for the future as well. I think that libraries can provide those kinds of advisory services when these policies come out. And again, some of the earlier speakers had pointed out, we're going to see more and more of this, I think, at the federal level. So it's a good role for us to consider. And that's what I have this afternoon, and I'm happy to take questions later on, certainly over lunch. Thank you.